Hi, everyone, and welcome to our panel event to talk about our environment, environmental justice issues as part of the CBA's People's Budget. My name is Colleen Fitzsimmons. I'm a volunteer with San Diego 350, one of the four organizations that make up the CBA's Environmental Justice Working Group, along with Outdoor Outreach, Environmental Health Coalition, and Mid-City Community Action Network. So today's event is hosted by the Community Budget Alliance, or CBA. We're a coalition of over 25 community, labor, and faith-based organizations. We work every day to stand up for our communities by making sure the city spends money it has to increase community wealth, health, and to bring justice to all communities. That means spending more money in places with more need or that have been historically excluded and spending less money in the places that already have access to more programs, services, and opportunities. We believe the city, city budget should reflect community needs, address inequalities, and must simultaneously provide vital services and programs that ensure a high quality of life for all our communities. Our city should be transparent about how it spends public dollars and the community should have a say in the distribution of those resources, which belong to us all. To do this, the Community Budget Alliance organizations work on budget advocacy, budget education, and community engagement efforts year round. By redefining public safety, improving environmental health, increasing housing access, securing workers' rights, and ensuring equitable access to services, we believe that San Diego can become a city that works better for everyone. So now I'll hand it over to Julie for the next section. Thank you and welcome everyone. Hello everyone. I'm just um, waiting for my slides to pop up. I hope everyone's uh, doing well this evening. Thank you so much for coming out um, to support our environmental justice asks uh, for the budget, um, I know at Zoom we are all we're all tired of, of the screen time, and um, so thank you so much for your time. It's it's really appreciated. Um, give me one more second. I'm just waiting for my slides to come up. Here we go. All right. Um, so as Colleen mentioned, um, we. The CBA, the Community Budget Alliance, has um, a lot of, of asks uh, that we're advocating for uh, for the city budget to be included in the city budget. And this panel focuses on our environmental justice asks. Um, my name is Julie Corrales. I work for Environmental Health Coalition. We are um, an organization that has been advancing environmental justice for 40 years in the San Diego and Tijuana region. Um, we, uh, we advance this work in our environmental justice communities of Barrio Logan, Logan Heights, City Heights, uh, National City, and Colonia Chimpancingo um, in, uh, in Tijuana. Um, and so, I guess that before we jump into our ask, we wanted to talk about what is uh, environmental environmental justice, right? Because this this term gets uh, thrown around. We've been hearing it a lot lately, right? It's um it's trending, and um, sometimes it get it can uh, get confused. You can get co opted and get confused with um, uh, you know with climate change and all those things. And it, it but it is separate than climate justice. It is different. It is actually rooted in um, the civil rights movement um, of, of um, the 1960s. And uh, it's really about, it's, it's the people's response to environmental racism. So the real question is, what is environmental racism? Um, uh, next slide, please, Jean-Louis. Um, so I was gonna throw it out to you guys. I wanted to, to, to ask, what, when you guys hear, and I'm talking to the audience here, please feel free to respond in the chat. Um, when you hear environmental, environmental racism, what do you think of um, when you hear this term? Are you familiar with it? Um, and, when you, when, and when you do hear it, what do you think of? Unequal air quality, yes, absolutely, that's part of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Air quality that keeps coming up, absolutely, right? The air that we breathe. Um, everyone should breathe the same, the same safe air, right? Lack of access to natural resources, absolutely. We see that in environmental justice communities. Yes, lack of green space, absolutely. 
Yes, lack of income infrastructure, the trucks, absolutely. The degrading of the environment and health, partly due to race of the people, absolutely. Industrial toxic development, development, yep, low income, disparities in health outcomes, and equitable distribution of resources. Yes. Thank you, John. Thank you for giving us uh, the good uh, the good old links to continue educating everyone. Ships, absolutely the ships, water and land pollution. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, it seems like we have a well-versed group here. Um, yeah, environmental racism is all of those things. John, we can you can you uh, go to the next slide, please? Um, oh, my text isn't popping up. Do you want to hit the next slide? There should be some text there, but if not, I can I can just speak it. There it is. So um, we define environmental racism in in uh, at EHC as policies and activities of governments, corporations, educational institutes, structural uh, structural organizations with the power to influence um, policies and activities of those organizations that either intentionally or unintentionally result in the people of, of people of color and low income people being exposed to greater environmental hazards. So the disproportionate impact of environmental hazards on people of color. And so you can see in these pictures, um, this home is right next to this industrial um, you know, it's actually a recycling yard. And, you know, in the, and next to these homes, you can see the port and the cranes in the background. And, and I, this is pictures in Tijuana, um, this woman who, who used to have a river um, in, in her community and now it's, it's concrete. So next slide, please. So uh, then what is environmental justice? Can you do, can you click John, me please? Um, environmental justice is the movement's response to environmental racism. Environmental justice is the right of all people and communities to live, work, and play in a clean and safe environment. John Wee, next slide, please. There it is. You can, one more, please. So where are our environmental justice communities? Um, there is a great tool that all of you guys can access. I don't know if everyone's familiar with it, but Cal Enviro Screen is a statewide tool that takes uh, indicators, um, including like air quality, um, uh, uh, cancer risk, asthma risk, and other socioeconomic, socioeconomic factors as well, race, language barriers, income, and combines them to see which communities are most vulnerable to um, toxic pollution. and um, and as you can see, the red is, uh, this is a snapshot of San Diego. The red are the environmental justice communities in our region. And again, it's you know, Barrio Logan, Logan Heights, Southeast, some of City Heights, right? All, 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 we've seen this map before, right? Lots of places and it's kind of the same communities over and over impacted and impacted. Um, the picture here on the left, every single dot is a um, air quality or hazardous material, materials permit. Um, and if you can see where they all congregate, um, again, it's in our communities, right? Communities of color. Next slide, please. Oh, back one, please. Thank you. So how are we disproportionately affect? Why are we disproportionately affected? It's not uh, it's not by accident, right? We know we know it's redlining. Um, so see, here's the map again, right? All the communities that are impacted are all the communities that were redlined. Um, uh, in, in early last century, right? We this is the same map, um, and what happens is, you know, they say these communities and just were undesirable. They're black and brown communities, so we can put all the um, we don't have to invest in infrastructure there. We talked. Someone was talking about infrastructure in the chat. We don't have to invest in infrastructure. We don't have to care about the green, you know, the green space for them. Um, and we and anything that's undesirable, we can put there. We can put the industry there. We can put the, we can put the things that we don't want to see in our backyard, right? Saying we uh, people. In power at the time um, and if, if, we, if we need a place an in interstate you know we're not going to cut through our communities we're going to put it through these undesirable communities um, here on on the left this is we are working currently to update the barrio logan plan but this is the plan that's currently in place now and all the light orange and dark orange allows for industry immediately next to a home that is still allowed to this day in barrio logan um, so this is these are the effects of redlining um, and racist land use policies that have resulted in, in this type of um, environment. Next slide, please. Next, there we go. Um, so how does environmental racism affect us? Um, and you guys can feel free to chime in the chat again. 
what do you see in your community that that are like visual or you know palpable tangible effects of environmental racism and um i think that these these pictures really show it you know like this uh top right is barrio logan playground next to a uh shipping cargo right like a, a ship is literally next to the port these things while they park they spew diesel in the air and so these kids are playing and inhaling it um down here you see city heights and you see you know a cafe next to a muffler shop um and 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 the traffic here this, this guy poor guy walking is inhaling all of this right we see recycling yard fires in barrio logan this is choice creek this is what divestment in in um in green spaces and um, in our infrastructure looks like we get this uh, these polluted these polluted areas that really should be of service to the community. Next slide. And it's not just I think the most important thing to take from all of this is not just um, unsightly. It's not just that we don't have fair access. It's not that I mean those are all important things, but more than anything, it impacts our health. Um, we have, again, higher cancer risk in Barrio Logan. We have a 98th, 99th percentile in the nation. Um, we have the highest asthma rates in uh, our region. Um, the, 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 the PM 2.5 particles that are spewed out, they, they are tiny. This is a cross, cross section of a hair. They are so small, they, they get into our lungs and they get into our bloodstream. Um, next slide, please. And um, one more time, please, John Lee. Apologies, I have a little, little um, no, the one before John Lee. I have uh, um, animations in my slides because you know I like to do that, and I don't think I warned John Lee about it. I apologize. Um, so air, air pollution can you know when you're standing behind a truck and you breathe it in and you're like and you cough and you get this nausea and irritation you know that's that's less serious that's you know minimal exposure and then as you continue to be exposed to asthma bronchitis and then those of us that live in communities of uh, in environmental justice communities we're the ones that end up with liver damage cancer birth defects nervous systems recent studies um as as um recent as 2019 show that carbon that carbon that pm 2.5 affects all of our organs, our lungs, our brain, we're more susceptible to cardiac arrest, we're more susceptible to strokes, um, hemorrhages, um, reproduction health, reproductive health, um, low birth weight. And now they're even linking um, PM 2.5 particles in our brain. They're so small, they reach our brains. They're linking it to dementia, to Alzheimer's, and even to behavioral problems. So um, this is, uh, it's a huge health, a public health issue. And so this is what we are, we are fighting against. Um, and this is what we're, and, and remedying racist land use policies and environmental racism is what we're attempting to do um, in, in addressing the budget. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just one more slide talking about health, health impacts. Um, San Diego County average of uh, asthma emergency room visit rates per children is about 40,000. Um, per year in, in 2018. And if you look at our community, City Heights, it's 80,000. Um, San Ysidro, it's, it's 100,000. And Barrio Logan, it's 110,000 compared to La Jolla's 20,000 kids. And, and so these effects are real. They are, they are impacting our health every day. They're impacting our, our, our longevity. Um, I, I, I think it's like 10 years difference um, from one zip code to the next, depending on, on how much of this you're inhaling. So uh, serious consequences. Next slide, please. So how do we advance environmental justice? Um, so we focus on environmental justice communities. As we're looking to ad advance different policy, we start here, we start now in the communities that are most effective, uh, affected, I'm sorry, the ones that are most impacted. Um, we transition to electrical vehicles, not just cars, but you know, transit, drayage trucks, um, forklifts, you know, all the things that are spewing diesel in these communities that are impacted by, by racist land use policy and have these incompatible land uses. Um, we incentivize transit use in our communities first, right? Like, let, get us off the road. Let's let's stop contributing to our own um, to the own pollution in our communities. Give us the clean transit first, and get us on transit first because we are the most impacted. Um, separating compatible land uses through planning policy. We have to continue to do that. We have to reverse these racist land use policies through our community plans. It's ongoing. It is. It's still in there, and we still have to weed it out. Uh, create green spaces to sequester carbon and provide alternatives to driving um, so we get out of our cars, right? And how do we do all this? We have to fund it. We fund it through the city budget. We fund it through all sorts of ways, right? Any, any way we can, but we have to hold the city accountable. The city has to um, 
uh, include uh, funding for environmental justice priorities to undo a historical, a historic systemic uh, racist 90s policy and environmental racism. So I just wanted to give you guys all that spiel and get us um, on the same page about why this is important um, and how it impacts us. This is literally our lives um, and our children's lives and our neighbors' lives. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much um, for taking the time to learn about this. I am going to hand it off to Kiara to tell us how we can advance environmental justice through the city budget. Thanks, Julie. My name is Tara Pina. I'm a researcher and policy advocate on the Center on Policy Initiatives. Um, so as Julie laid out, we fight for environmental justice to ensure that communities most impacted by environmental racism, which tend to be low-income communities, communities of color, are actively engaged in decisions regarding neighborhood land use and climate initiatives to develop equitable policies and budget allocations. Um, through prioritizing community environmental health and the quality of life for all residents, San Diego can be a city where everyone enjoys a healthier environment free of toxic waste with access to clean air and to energy efficient and diverse mobility options. So in order to achieve those goals of climate environmental justice, the CBA Environmental Justice Working Group has put together a list of priorities that we're advocating for in the budget cycle, this budget cycle that's going on right now. I will briefly introduce this list and then we'll kind of go into more details on each of these priorities later in the event with our panelists. So first we wanna ensure that the four city of San Diego representatives on the MTS board prioritize transit riders in the MTS budget. So given the city of San Diego is the largest city served by this local transit agency, transit riders and working families deserve proactive investment and support from the city. To do this, we're advocating for youth opportunity passes, which are no cost transit passes for youth 24 and under to increase access to educational and work related opportunities for youth in San Diego. And then we're also asking for the city to prioritize transit investments, support transit riders and hold MTS accountable by decriminalizing fare evasion, guaranteeing that MTS doesn't cut services or routes in transit dependent communities, prioritizing buses, electric buses in transit dependent communities and ensuring access to bathrooms and appropriate amenities near bus stops. Our second ask is to advance park development in communities of concern um, for the following parks. So we're advocating for investments in Emerald Hills Park in District 4, Boston Avenue Linear Park in District 8, Berardini Field in District 9, Troyes Creek Watershed Regional Park, and Castana Street Natural Park in District 4 and Kelly Street Neighborhood Park in District 7. These parks need various funding amounts to either be able to develop a project plan, design the park, build the park, or make necessary updates. Third, we're urging the city to make sure that the updated climate action plan includes creating local green jobs, increasing access to low cost and efficient transit, and securing clean energy provision. And we'll explain more about the Climate Action Plan or CAP uh, a little bit later, but the plan is critical to establishing a comprehensive strategy to achieve carbon neutrality by 2045 and really lays a roadmap for the city on how to address its climate goals. And then we also wanna ensure that the city has the infrastructure needed to enforce the city's truck route ordinance by constructing street calming infrastructure Street calming infrastructure, things like um, speed bumps and roundabouts, things like that, that kind of slow down traffic on specific streets in Barrio Logan to um, prevent trucks from going on, you know, through the neighborhoods to reduce pollution, increase resident safety, and physically keep trucks off of residential streets and away from homes, schools, and medical facilities. Our fifth priority is to ensure meaningful community engagement per the SB 1000 requirements on the city's general plan, environmental justice elements. And this is kind of a plan for how to address environmental justice in the city and city staff should work with the community to develop a robust public outreach, outreach plan for that component. And finally, we're asking for the city to establish a clear and consistent low cost to no cost event permitting process for nonprofit and community based organizations hosting activities and group events within city parks and recreation to increase park access for low income communities. So we're asking for these many priorities 
should take bold action to address climate change and fight for environmental justice. And now I wanna transition kind of into the next section of our event. We're gonna hear from my fellow working group members on you know, more in depth about the issues behind these priorities, how our priorities will begin to address these issues and how you can help advocate with us going forward. So we have a lot to cover. Uh, so first I'll introduce Chris Sotomayor with Mid City Can who will be walking us through youth opportunity passes and MTS asks with panelists Denise Lopez and Deanna Frias. So Chris, take your way. Hey folks, can you see me? Yes. Rad. Hi, my name is Chris Mayor. My pronouns are they, them, AJ, and I'm the transportation justice organizer at uh, Mid-City CAN. Um, I want to talk to you folks today uh, specifically about transportation uh, justice and how we can get to um, a greener San Diego and a greener planet uh, through considerations um, in transportation justice. Um, uh, Kiera and Julie did a fantastic job, I think, outlining exactly uh, what, um, how environmental justice impacts our community and why it's important. Um, so I want to highlight to you folks today, um, specifically a movement um, in the way that we view or the way that we perceive um, transportation justice. I think our narrative has to change. Um, we have to stop seeing it in terms of like, oh, um, you know, buses or highways. Um, we need to see it in, in light of um, specifically transit dependent communities and the people that are accessing transit, right? So a lot of times um, when legislation is made or, or decisions are, are taken um, regarding uh, access to transportation, to public transportation, um, transit dependent communities are a second thought, right? So a lot of times a decision will be made. Um, for example, we're gonna increase um, passes to this amount. Um, and the community that, that affects or the main constituents that would be utilizing that um, are kind of just a blip, just kind of a, you know, afterthought, like, oh, also, this might affect people that don't necessarily have the money to pay for um, transportation increases. Um, so we need a transition from that brain set. Um, and we need to, number one, stop thinking of our transit dependent community as a source of income. Um, it, that is no longer a, a model. It was never a model that um, centered equity and it's not a model that is gonna get the city of San Diego um, to progress. So our kind of um, first step in, in pushing um, for transit to medical communities to not be seen as a source of income are youth opportunity passes. So youth opportunity passes are no cost transportation for young people and it is our hope that everybody under the age of 25 um, would be included in that. And the reason that we do up until 24 and not just till 18 is because young people between the ages of 18 to 24 um, are opportunity young people, right? So um, that is a very um, uh, opportunity is kind of a key age to get young people connected um, to, to working opportunities, to educational opportunities, um, and getting them plugged into some kind of um, long-term career or a long-term trajectory. Um, in addition to youth opportunity passes, uh, Mid-City CAN um, and a lot of our wonderful community partners, including our Transportation Equity Working Group, have been uh, working for a few extra additional causes. Um, those also include decriminalizing transportation uh, by moving uh, fare evasion tickets from uh, misdemeanor to being uh, processed perhaps through homeless court so that it no longer adversely affects a person that receives a, a fare evasion ticket. Um, we also want there to be a guarantee that MTS is not gonna cut services or routes in transit dependent communities. Um, we want electric buses to be prioritized specifically in transit dependent communities. Um, and we also want to ensure that there is access to bathrooms and appropriate amen amenities near all bus stops. Um, so those are just kind of some key highlights of the things that we're working on. Um, and I, I believe that uh, it, uh, Diana and Denise, who are about to speak after me, um, can really share their experiences as, as young people who live in San Diego um, and who have 
been involved in uh, transportation justice for a while, they can really share from their experience like how how this impacts them and how these moves um, in this different direction would kind of reshape uh, the way that things look for them. Um, so Diana or Denise, take it away. Hi everyone, my name is Diana Frias. I'm a senior from Hooper High School. Sorry, I can't turn my camera on today. Um, yeah, Denise and I have been working on this campaign since our freshman year. Uh, and uh, Uh, um, coming from a family of um, two working parents, I've had to find solutions of how to get around, especially since I'm very involved in um, school and in my community. I had to find a way of how to get to school, to and from school, um, without having to kind of rely on my parents. So um, when I was introduced to this campaign my freshman year, I was like, wow, like this is what I need. <laughs> and it's just like, I don't know, it was very interesting that it found me at that time. And um, through it, I've been able to get to my meetings, get to school. Um, and overall, just allowed me to become a little bit more independent and responsible. And I think that's something that the youth in my community and communities alike, City Heights would benefit from. Um, and as it was mentioned, we shouldn't be a second thought since this, like the name says it, opportunity. You know, there's so many things that we could be doing, but if we do not have access to it, how are we supposed to do it? So yeah, that's uh, just to, um, I don't know how much time I have, I'll let Denise speak on, on that as well, because I know she has a lot to say. Thanks, Diana. Um, so for me, I'm, my name's Denise Lopez. I'm a woman in Hoover High School. I'm a senior, and I started Mid-City Can when I was a freshman. When we were introduced, me and Diana, in the Youth Opportunity Passive, we both experiencing the troubles as having been low income, being in a low income family and having the reason to go to school. I was lucky that my school is away 10 minutes. Oh, my school is 10 minutes away. But when I needed transportation, it's for my extra activities that I always did. Because I always, since I was a little kid, I was always involved in my school, in my school and activities outside. So the transportation helped me get around everywhere. I used the trolley, I used the bus, I can get around without, without getting lost in the bus. So when use opportunity passes was, was happening we saw that this is an opportunity because we spent too much money on transportation but we didn't don't get any anything involved and when during our 11 year our our junior year we have pushed mts to make it a gr the green the bus to be electric because we we walked by the bus and we felt like the pollution coming to us as as the bus driver passed us walking to school. And we saw the effects in security and how low maintenance they were for us students when we had to catch the bus or go anywhere in the mid, in, in mid city, in mid city kind of area or anywhere where people of color are. And we noticed the difference between where a community of, of where there's more tax benefit, more help, than our community that's low income. Thank you so much, uh, Denise and Diana for sharing. Um, so yeah, folks, I, I think um, Denise and Diana did a terrific job outlining um, not just why this matters, but the tremendous difference that, that it makes in the lives of our young people, specifically like young people in our communities, right? Um, so uh, again, um, I think the issue of transportation justice is kind of something that, you know, we look over, like it's not necessarily something that you think about like, 
I'm going to save the world through transportation justice. Um, however, the, the, the benefits and the impacts are, are really monumental. Um, so if you're a person that's kind of interested in uh, tapping in and figuring out how to support, um, we are really, really keen on getting these youth opportunity passes um, included in the regional transportation plan. Um, and there is a draft of that supposed to go out in May. Um, so we'll be sending out updates for folks like uh, with information on actions if you want to get involved or um, if you want to let the MTS board know what you think. Uh, so we'll be sending out that information. And I believe I, I think our time is almost up. I'll go ahead and take some questions. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, uh, you can put them either in the chat or in the Q&A box, um, or you can raise your hand, I believe, um, and we can answer those. We'll leave a few minutes for, for a little bit of time for people to put in questions, um, and then we will move on to talking about parks. Anyone have any questions? Thank you, Denise and Diana, for sharing your stories. Looks like we don't have any questions now. Um, if you still have questions, you can always put them in the Q&A and we will come back to them as we go on in this event. Um, and Ariana put some information as well in the chat about YOP um, and pledging support if you want to get more involved that way. So thank you, Chris, Diana, and Denise. Um, parks are so central to our community health and well-being. Um, and so hopefully we can work together um, you know, to make sure that we have more access to transit. So um, now we're going to move on to talking about parks, um, figuring out how we can you know, get access to um, more green space in, in different communities in San Diego. So I'll invite Les up um, with Tatiana, Amy, and Leslie. Excellent, thank you. Thank you so much, Kara. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Les Duncan. I am the Senior Director of Programs at a nonprofit based in San Diego called Outdoor Outreach um, that helps to connect youth to the transformative power of the outdoors, recognizing that being in outdoor spaces, being able to enjoy um, our amazing natural resources here in San Diego is not only important for fun and for recreation, but is, is super important to health and the well being of communities. And so today uh, we're, we're really elevating uh, some of our Community Budget Alliance asks around park and park development. Um, at Outdoor Outreach and across, um, across the, the Environmental Justice Working Group and the Community Budget Alliance as a whole, we really value uh, the development of parks in especially communities that have either lacked access to parks. So looking at communities that have, you know, oftentimes less than three acres of park space per every thousand residents, as well as um, pro prioritizing making sure that those park spaces are, are available, um, especially in low income communities and communities of color. And so we'll talk about a few of these. Um, you'll see listed on the screen, some of the parks that we, that we are prioritizing this year, uh, prioritizing for the city to really make uh, strong investments in. And so without going any further, I'd love to introduce um, our esteemed uh, panelists for, for this discussion. Um, and then open it up at, at the end for, for some questions as well. Our three panelists this evening um, include uh, Tatiana Butte, who is an outstanding young leader. She's a 2019 Outdoor Outreach uh, Leadership Program graduate um, and has gone on to, to really become an, an outstanding advocate for equity and access in the outdoors, both here locally, um, as well as on a, state, uh, on a statewide and national level. Uh, next is Amy Ito, uh, who's a spokesperson and youth liaison um, with the Alliance of Youth Advocates, the AYA. Um, she's here tonight uh, sharing especially about uh, why Kelly Street Neighborhood Park is so important and so vital um, to her and to her community. And then last but certainly not least 
is Leslie Reynolds, who has been an absolute champion here in San Diego. She's the executive director of Groundwork San Diego, um, who also convenes the Choice Creek Coalition. Um, the Choice Creek is, is a creek that uh, stems from Lemon Grove all the way out to uh, San Diego Bay um, and is in, is in huge need of revitalization. So Leslie will share a little bit about that with us today as well. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass uh, the floor over to Tatiana to share a little bit about why parks and park access is so important, so, so critical to her. Thank you, Les, for that amazing introduction. And welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Tatiana, Bia, as you heard. I feel that parks are so important because they're not only vital, they're not only vital to the environment, but they're vital to ourselves. Growing up in District 4, I have encountered, I have encountered so much within my personal life, uh, struggling with some mental health issues and with juggling so much within my family life and school. And the one relief I can always go to was the outdoors and to the parks. And going to my local parks, some of them are very disproportionately um, advertised or they're very are lacking so many resources such as one of the parks here emerald hills park um in my time in school we did a lot of community cleanups and a lot of um rehabilitation and growth of it not only because it's by the freeway by the night by the 94 but it's also one of the most lacking communities since we're in the communities of color it's very overlooked and there's not that many veg vegetation and it doesn't look like a park it's just a very plain area and the communities who surround it, there's a school right by there and kids usually go there to have fun and such, but it's been plagued with um, the history of, of um, not being one of the most safe parks. And I believe that it has one of the most beautiful views in San Diego, overlooking the whole entire San Diego, looking over Coronado Bridge and just seeing what San Diego has to offer. And that's why some of these parks are neglected and should be the more developed and more looked at since communities of color historically have been overlooked in their communities and they and no one sees the need of them. And so that's why I believe parks are so important because the communities who inhabit them are the next generation to to flood our life and to see a new possibility within within not only ourselves but within themselves. And so I will now pass it over to Les or Amy. Yes, no, thank you for that, Tati, uh, for Tatiana. And, and that is so important. You elevated Emerald Hills Park, um, that the Community Budget Alliance has really been, has really been, out, um, has, has really been demanding funding for, um, for, for a few years now. And in 2019, I believe it was, uh, funding was allocated uh, for community-led design process, but we haven't seen any developments come up that yet. And so that's been a huge part of our demand there. Thanks so much for that. I wanna turn, turn the floor over to Amy Ito, who will, who will share a little bit about her local park, um, why that's so important to her and, and what she's really demanding for that park. Hi everybody, thank you again for inviting me here. My name is Amy Ito, I'm 15 years old and I'm here on behalf of the Alliance of Youth Advocates. Um, just a little bit on our group, we focus on improvements in Linda Vista within the Linda Vista community and um, you know what, whatever that entails. So currently um, we have been noticing um, the just importance of Kelly Park and its renovation. Um, we love using this park. It's literally one of the most beautiful parks that I've ever been to. Um, and it's super spacious, you know, but the concerns are there's a lot of safety concerns and renovations needed. But like we have mentioned before, um, racial um, redlining and stuff has limited that. Um, we have asked for renovation, both for um, modernization and accessibility to all because there's a lot of um, accessibility um, regulations that aren't met. And um, well, like within that, the ADA, um, American, Amer American Disability Alliance, 
um, had identified this park as um, out of compliance since 2001. So that's almost 20 years ago that the city um, you know, claimed that this park was not accessible to all and wasn't safe to all people. And um, we still haven't gotten those renovations and stuff. So um, it's just, it's such an, a, a beautiful park and it's not really taken seriously because of, you know, its location and the Linda Vista community because of, you know, the reputation it has and stereotypes and all that, that entails with that. So um, just a little um, personal part, um, my dance group, I, I practiced there for a while. Um, our group, AYA, Alliance of Youth Advocates, um, held a lot of meetings there and we just love using that park. We've brought out a whole bunch of um, different events there and um, little kids, you know, kids our age, adults, even families, and we love using that park. It's just the safety regulations aren't being met. So it's just, we, we really need to get on top of our game for that. So thank you. Thanks so much for highlighting that, Amy. And that's that's so key. Some of the points that you brought up there around, you know, the safety of parks, um, and that goes hand in hand with improvements and the the development of those the facilities within those spaces, um, and the maintenance of those parks is so key to actually activating it. Right? It's one thing to have the space there. Um, it's another thing for it to actually be functionally useful for for youth and families. Um, that cherish those parks, uh, that have those parks in their community. So thanks so much for that. Next, I wanna turn it over to Leslie Reynolds, who has been an outstanding champion for the Choice Creek. Uh, Leslie, tell us a little bit about the Choice Creek and some, some of the improvements that are needed there. And I mean, it's been, it's been decades, it's been a decades long struggle in, in really getting um, to the revitalization of it. So could, could you share a little bit more with us about that? Sure, thank you so much, Les, and thanks to Amy and Tatiana for powerful remarks about overlooked parks and, and how critical they are. Groundwork was formed in about 2007 to lead uh, the Choyas Creek Enhancement Program, which was a document, a vision document, stakeholder-driven vision document, uh, to look at improvements throughout the, the Choyas Creek watershed. And as Les mentioned, the watershed uh, runs north and south of the 94 from Lemon Grove to 32nd Street and from La Mesa on the north side down to 32nd Street. Um, and so uh, when we formed, our, our goal was really to try to look at equity throughout the, the watershed in terms of green spaces and green infrastructure, parks and trails. One of the things that we noticed um, quickly was that many, many parks, including a couple that are on the, our list for this year's budget, um, had languished in the unfunded parks uh, list for a decade plus. And it occurred to us that our voice as Groundwork San Diego would be so much stronger if we were able to collaborate with organizations and residents throughout our watershed. And so with that in mind, uh, a, a number of us got together about a year ago and formed this emerging coalition called the Choyas Creek Coalition. And the goal of the Choyas Creek Coalition really is to bring all of these voices to bear on parks and green spaces in our watershed. And our notion is that working together, we can prioritize projects uh, really elevate the top priorities and go after them with abandon and keep after them until they're funded and then lift the next batch of them out of the community plans and out of the unfunded park list so that every year we can see some real accomplishment and report back to our neighborhoods that, that things are improving. One of the things on our list is the Choice Creek Regional Park uh, Plan and designation. Uh, unfortunately, and but perhaps not surprisingly to any of you, Choyas Creek Watershed is the only one in the region that does not have a master plan. So you can think about the Otai River Belt, uh, Otai Regional Park, uh, the San Diego Regional Park, the San Diego River Park. So somehow over all these decades, the Choyas Creek Watershed has been overlooked. And part of that um, underinvestment is what we as a Choice Creek Coalition are, are trying to, to address. 
Um, specific projects, uh, you'll see one in Barrio Logan, which is the Boston Linear Park, one in D4, which is the Castana Street Natural Park, which is a blighted space owned by city uh, public utilities and just a real embarrassment to the city. And then there's one in Webster, which is Berardini Field, again, has been on the unfunded park list for 11 years, if you can imagine. So um, we're just, all of us, I think, working together shoulder to shoulder to try to lift these projects up and uh, draw attention and appropriate funding to them. So thank you, Les. Absolutely, thank you, Leslie. And Leslie, let me ask also, the effort also is, is not only for park improvements, but, but really to connect all of the parks along the watershed as well, right? Exactly. In fact, what's envisioned and what was envisioned in the Choyas Creek Enhancement Program, again in 1998, here we are 20 some odd years later, uh, was a creek to bay trail system linked uh, by trails and parks and green spaces. So you can imagine being able to ride your bike or walk uh, from the eastern portions, Lemon Grove and La Mesa, all the way down to the Bayshore Bikeway. We're working hard right now on the connection down uh, at 32nd Street, uh, thinking then we'll start working back up to the eastern reaches once we get that critical connection to San Diego Bay. Absolutely, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I, I mean, I just, I, I, I try to imagine what a San Diego would look like that's connected in that type of way where people could, could begin to use alternative, alternative means of transportation to get about the city um, and, and just how it would open our city up to other opportunities for outdoor recreation. And we really elevate this because, you know, again, outdoor recreation is so much more critical than, you know, just having fun, right? Like, and having fun is important, but we know that it's so connected to the health and well-being of communities and parks is literally directly connected as you've seen some of the maps shown earlier in the presentation is connected to the health of communities. Um, I mean, one statistic and I'll kind of end on, on this is just a 20 minute walk in your local neighborhood park has been shown by studies to be the equivalent of an antidepressant. Right, imagine that a city, a community where we had access to, to open, safe, equitable, accessible uh, park spaces for, for all. Um, so I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave you all the audience with kind of what that vision could be like um, and what, what that means for, for the next stage of our work. Thanks so much for that. And I will pass it back to Kiara. Thank you, Les. Um, if anyone, again, has questions, you can put them in the chat um, or in the Q&A. Um, it was great to hear from all of you about why investments in green spaces are so needed, uh, especially from our youth advocates. Thank you, Tatiana and Amy. Um, so I don't see any questions as of now. Again, you know, we can answer them as we go on. Um, but I will now introduce Julie and Philomena to discuss enforcing the city's truck route ordinance to ensure that our communities have access to cleaner air. So Julie, you're up. Hi everyone, um, thanks for having me back. Um, uh, I wanted to uh, invite to the conversation Philomena Marino. She is a uh, local Barrio Logan um, resident. Um, and she also sits on the community planning um, group. Uh, and she has been very active in trying to um, remedy this, this truck problem that we've had in Barrio Logan. Um, Philomena, do you wanna come off camera and say hello before we get started? Um, not right now, just give me a second. Sure, take your time. Um, so I will start uh, by saying that um, Barrio Logan, as I mentioned at, 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 um, at the beginning of our time together, um, is one of the communities, is the most polluted community in our region. Um, we are in the top 5% of the entire state. Um, we are in the 98th percentile of cancer risk of the entire nation. Um, we are heavily polluted. Um, and so we are asking, uh, and, and part of that pollution uh, is from the Bay from the port um, 
and all the industry that's happening there from the incompatible land use of industry next to homes and welding and all sorts of, of manufacturing that's happening next to homes. And also because of the intersection of freeways, right? We have freeways um, cutting through our neighborhood. Uh, when the interstates came, they chose our community um, to, to uh, section off. So we have the 75, the Coronado Bridge, we have the five, we have the 15, uh, we have the 94. And so um, we, um, are impacted, but one of the things that we can really advance um, is is getting the the dredge trucks and semis off of our streets because they they continue to spew diesel. Um, I where I live on Beardsley, I see anywhere from 10 to 20 trucks every day cross in front of my street, cross in front of Perkins Elementary. I've seen children maneuver around semi trucks that are making a turn to get to, these kids maneuver around them to get to school. Um, and, you know, I think that it's really unfortunate that our community has gotten used to those images. Um, I think that if you were walking in a more affluent neighborhood and you saw that, there would be more outrage, but we've been, we've been dealing with this problem for ever um, for and we've been trying to solution it for decades and decades. It seems like it's a, a, a hyper local problem, but it's not. Again, Barrio Logan bears the brunt of all of San Diego's pollution. Um, you don't have um, a, 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 a manufacturer spewing um, chemicals in your neighborhood because they put it in ours. And so it is a um, citywide problem um, that we have to address. Last year, um, we took it to the planning group, we took it to the city. Uh, 2018, a official truck route was created to keep the trucks off of our streets. But unfortunately, um, they weren't adhering to it. Um, they, they were, additional signage was posted and truck drivers kept um, uh, not not adhering to the truck route. And there's lots of reasons. We don't want to penalize small business. A lot of these truckers are small business owners. They own their trucks. They're trying to save on gas. A lot of them are not even educated uh, to the point uh, on the harms, the deep harm that, that diesel PM2.5 particles do to human beings and to children. And most of them are not educated on the impacts of Barrio Logan itself, how highly impacted we are cumulatively from all these sources. And so, um, and, and so we, we started an enforcement campaign last year. Um, the SDPD got involved, they started issuing tickets, but there's a problem with that, right? We're already an over-policed community. We don't need additional police in our community driving um, the streets. It's not the solution that works for us. So we started to think outside the box. Okay, so what is long-term? What's really gonna get these truckers off the street, uh, off our streets, our neighborhood streets? Um, and it's gonna take infrastructure. We're gonna need actual infrastructure to stop these trucks from coming onto these streets. Um, and that's going to have to take the form of roundabouts, um, uh, perpendicular parking, um, uh, uh, speed bumps, uh, street narrowing, uh, curb outs, things that actually stop the truckers from entering the streets and that costs money. Um, again, we are a very resilient community. We are not relying solely on general fund dollars. We are um, advocating for grants and other and other um, ways to bring this money in. We've, we've gained some, like we are on it, but it's also the city's responsibility to take care of its residents, right? Especially its most vulnerable. So we are um, demanding really that the city put in on this, that they also contribute $100,000 to um, these infrastructure changes. Um, so that's our ask in the budget. Um, I hope that we can count on um, community to, to support us on that. Again, it's, it seems hyper-local, but it's not, right? It's really a justice issue and a public health issue. Um, uh, Philomena, do you have a few minutes to talk about uh, your experience with the truck route and our long history um, trying to solution the problem? Yes. Um, hi, I'm Philomena and I'm a resident. I'm a professional resident living in an air pollution environment, Barrio Logan. And I would like. Um, oh. As Julie mentioned, um, God, oh as Julie mentioned, um, we, um, the neighbors, a lot of the neighbors here, we um, took the streets and started counting the number of trucks that were actually coming. So it's not so much of complaint, complaint. We were showing facts. We were showing statistics. We were showing data um, so that we could um, be heard 
And all right, I'm sorry. I, I need to, um, a lot of the people that helped and a lot of the people that are around me are senior citizens. And I know that um, um, you don't know me, but my passion is the senior citizens and um, I'm trying to be their voice. Just like there's a lot of young individuals on this call. Thank you so much for being the voice of the young. And if I could just make, wow, I am so sorry. I just heard of a fellow neighbor who's no longer here with us. Hey, and I'm taking a little bit too hard. Oh my gosh, Philly. Did you just learn about that right now? Yeah. So, um, oh. oh, honey, please. Um, take, please. Yeah, no, I just wanted, um, this is important because she won't be able to see the hard work that every single individual on this phone call, on this panel is doing. But I do hope that we continue to, like Leslie indicated, working together to connect our communities for the benefit of everyone, regardless of our age. So that they may enjoy it. Um, the parks are beautiful, but they can't enjoy it if they can't even leave their home because of fear of being run over by a truck. Um, the ingredients of air pollution, everybody knows them. We all try to stay away from that particular diet and it makes it really hard, especially when we're fed that piece of cake all the time. There's nothing we can do to avoid it. It's here. We open our window and it's there. And the people highly exposed to it are senior citizens and of course everyone, but their voice is not heard. Why is it not heard? Because they're tired. They just want to enjoy the remaining few years that are left with them. Cyclists, we hear that they're less exposed. I'm a cyclist and I'm gonna call bullshit on that. I'm sorry if I've offended anyone by saying that. When I cycle and I'm trying and I appreciate what Leslie's doing, trying to connect Choyas Creek and trying to connect me to get to Serrano Valley so I can get to work using my bicycle because I'm trying to be that part of that, protecting our beautiful environment. Then we have all of us, because every single one of us, we drive a vehicle of one form or another, whether it's a bicycle, whether it's a moped, a motorcycle, a car, a bus, something, we drive it. And we sit in traffic and we're exposed. And EHC is what they're trying to do is protect all, not just Barrio Logan, but the, our neighborhoods that are around us in district three, four and nine, because we're all neighbors, we're interconnected. So I just stop oh, kindly ask you to support us and help us voice. Oh, Thank you. Thank you, Philomena. I am so sorry to hear that. And I thank you so much for choosing to still come on the call and talk about your experience. I know um, I know that what you do for, for your community there of a lot of senior citizens and you have been their voice and you've been advocating against the trucks on Boston Avenue um, as long as I've known you and before that um, on behalf of them um, because they're endangered when they go outside because um, they're breathing in, uh, they're already compromised and uh, immune compromised, they're older and they're, they're breathing in this toxicity. I'm so sorry that you got this news right now. I'm so sorry for your loss. And I really thank you for coming on anyway and speaking. I don't know that I would have done that. I mean, it just, it's a testament to how much you care about our community. And I thank you for that, Philly. Um, with that, I'm gonna, um, on that sad note, but also, you know, um, em empowering and just and, and sobering note, I'm gonna pass that back to um, Kiara uh, for thank questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Philomena, um, for sharing. You know, a lot of people have been fighting for these priorities for a really long time. Um, that's a testament to, you know, this community and, and these coalitions and, you know, fighting through everything. So thank you. Um, we do have some questions about parks I want to return to. And also if anyone has questions about the trucker ordinance, please feel free to share. Um, so, Les, maybe this is a question for you. Um, 
We had a question in the Q&A box. I'm curious to hear details about Kelly Street and what are the main challenges to safety there? Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll open that up to, to Amy, to, to a resident in that neighborhood to maybe share a little bit first. I'm sorry, what was the question? Yeah, um, somebody had a question about the de de details about Kelly Street and what the main challenges to safety are in that, at that park. Okay, um, yeah. So Kelly Street Park is a park, um, so it's, it's right next to a community center building called Bayside that I um, am a part of also. But it's down the street and it's actually located in, in the middle of a neighborhood. And I actually didn't know about the park until we started working um, or doing events there. So um, it's it has pretty much it's like in a slope that's like surrounded by canyon. And there's a lot of um, homeless and um, violence and a lot of other safety regulations. Um, the bathrooms are not um, sanitary at all. They, like I said before, like I mentioned before that um, nothing from the park since it was built 20 to 30 years ago has been modified nor um, renovated. And so that's talking about, you know, late 1990s um, and stuff like that. So, um, it's um, it's really just um, you know needs um, actual modernization, excuse me, and um, there's a lot of uh, families that try to go there, but um, there's um, there's just a lot of people like I know. Okay, so talking from my personal experience, we. Um, I so due to COVID, we had to practice outside. So when we went there, um, it started getting super late. And even when we did have light there, um, there weren't enough lights. There was one or two pillars of lights, and we were just all huddled around that light. And you know, there were people walking late, and to say the least, weren't doing the best of things. And um, it was it it was just a concern not only for us as dancers and as you know people that go to practice there, but also for our families and the families in our neighborhood. Um, and just just the kids, like I, I remember when we would go, like we held events there and a lot of the, the families, the parents would be like, hey, like, is there a police officer there? And we would have to work with the police department to get law enforcement there because they didn't feel safe to send their kids out alone, even with us, even with um, us in adult supervision and stuff like that, so. Thank you for sharing. Um, again, if anyone has questions, um, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box and we'll answer them. Even if you have a question about something that was covered previously, um, we can come back to it. So um, thank you. And you know, thank you again to Julie and Philomena for sharing about the truck route ordinance. Um, I am now going to, we're going to finish off um, our like, kind of mini panel events uh, by discussing a broader strategy for how we can combat climate change and help our EJ communities. So I'm going to uh, introduce Kyle and Danny, who will be discussing the updated climate action plan and the city's environmental justice element. Thanks, Kiara, and everyone else. Uh, my name is Kyle Haskela. My pronouns are he, him, his. And I'm a climate justice policy advocate with the Environmental Health Coalition. First of all, I wanted to acknowledge all the incredible work that all the advocates here on the call are doing around parks and youth opportunity passes and the truck ordinance. It's really inspiring and incredible work. Um, Really excited to be a part of the panel tonight. As Julie mentioned earlier, uh, the EHC is a community-based environmental justice organization. And we're really working to empower residents to participate in the planning uh, of the future of our neighborhoods. 
So we believe everyone has a right to live in a safe and clean neighborhood where breathing doesn't make them sick. And that includes making sure that we have access to parks and uh, dealing with the emissions and pollution from transportation. Tonight, we've heard a lot about the grassroots advocacy opportunities, and I'm gonna introduce the two big planning documents that are moving through the city process right now. Uh, one is the climate action plan, which is being updated, and the other is the city's environmental justice element as a part of the general plan. Uh, both of these are more top-down policies, but they present opportunities to have more community input in the process, because one of the principles of environmental justice is self-determination. So we're working to make sure that that is a part of these plans and this process. And I'll throw it over to Danny to talk more about the EJ element. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, Danny with EHC. Um, and so I, I think, Kyle, you, you hit upon uh, some of the things I'm going to talk about. But basically, so I'm going to speak to Senate Bill 1000. And this is a state law that requires that the city update its general plan to address environmental justice. Um, environmental justice communities have a history of being excluded uh, far too often from the decision-making process. So in this context, addressing environmental justice means that public outreach, transparency, and inclusion need to be a top priority in developing any new policies for the general plan. While EHC uh, fully supports the, the, the city's decision to create a new standalone environmental justice element for the general plan to address SB 1000 or Senate Bill 1000, um, the outreach efforts thus far have been entirely insufficient. Uh, and it appears that the city isn't adequately staffing or providing uh, the necessary resources. So what we're asking for is $75,000 uh, to help the city to develop a robust outreach plan uh, with the community to help inform the city's development of its environmental justice element. And that concludes my presentation and we're here to address any questions. Thank you. Thank you Great. both. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Kyle. Yeah, I wanted to speak more on the, the climate action plan and, uh, and highlight some of the CBA asks around ensuring that the Climate Action Plan addresses local green jobs, increasing access to low cost and efficient transit. And for some context, the city's first Climate Action Plan was uh, written and adopted in 2015. And that for most people, climate action is dealing with really abstract concepts like greenhouse gases and climate change, instead of dealing with the everyday issues, like a lot of people on the panel have brought up so far, the toxic air pollution having industrial uses next to schools and homes. So many advocates for, for a long time have advocated for equity being prioritized in the climate action plan. And uh, we can't tackle the, the challenges around climate change while ignoring these very real uh, lack of basic resources and amenities in, in our communities that result in what Julie was mentioning earlier about the disproportionate rates of asthma and the, the pollution from diesel trucks. So we need to start in these communities first and make sure that they're prioritized in any investments that are a result of a climate action plan. So transportation is about 40% of our greenhouse gases, but overall San Diego has ranked as well, the sixth worst city in the nation for ozone pollution. So we have a lot of room to improve in air quality. And when it was first written, the climate action plan also didn't have any strategies around improving air quality. So that's one of the opportunities that we have this year is to make sure that it's dealing with public health, air quality, and equity. The city of Oakland recently updated its climate action plan within the last year, and they turned it into an equitable climate action plan, and it has equity throughout. 
So this is an opportunity for us as San Diegans to advocate for our city to also do something similar. So we're working together to make sure that community members are participating in this process so that uh, the needs of the community are reflected in the actual update. And with that, I'll throw it back to Kiara. Thank you. Uh, we do have a question about the EJ element um, and then a larger question that I'll kind of throw for anyone. Um, so first, how was the 75,000 amount determined for the EJ element engagement ask? Currently, the city has allocated 113,000 for engagement targeted to communities of concern to inform the CAP update. Well, I think that's a two part question. Um, I think the first thing that I'll say is that the, the city's climate action plan is just that it's a plan to address uh, climate. Uh, and so that's the scope of that project. Um, there is overlap, obviously, when you talk about climate change and climate planning and climate equity, when you talk about environmental justice and environmental justice planning and environmental racism. But I think that there are, there are two separate processes. So you have the climate action plan and then you have the general plan. SB 1000 uh, is that is a separate process from the, from the climate action plan. It's for the general plan. It requires a city to update its general plan to address environmental justice. And it, requ it requires that the city have a, a robust, you know, a, a strong uh, outreach uh, component to help develop um, policies to, to try to undo uh, uh, the environmental injustices that we have. And so, $75,000 would be there to help the city in its efforts to update its general plan. Again, I'm not talking about the, the, the climate action plan. It would be to help to update the general, uh, the, the general plan and ensure that, um, that the outreach is really robust. I mean, to date, uh, the project just got kicked off in late last year, but to date, there hasn't been enough outreach and I get the sense that one of the reasons for that might be that there's not enough funding and not, or not enough resources or both. And so the $75,000 would be to support, uh, you know, the city and having enough uh, staffing and enough resources to really go out and ensure that, um, you know, stakeholders from environmental justice communities are brought in to help develop um, 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 to help one, develop a public outreach plan, so that's step one, and two, to help uh, the city act as a sounding board along the way in developing policies to address environmental justice um, along the way. And it's expensive, I mean, you, but it's totally necessary and, and, and I think um, really required to do uh, the environmental justice element well. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Danny. Um, we have another question, um, and then I'll see if we have time for one more question, and then we're going to take action because um, that's what CBA is all about. So um, this question is kind of for anybody um, in the working group. How big of a factor in environmental justice is the prevention of gentrification following environmental improvements? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that question? It kind of cut out. Uh, how big of a factor in environmental justice is the prevention of gentrification following environmental improvements? And really anyone from the working group is, is free to take this one on. Sure, I'm, I'm happy. Can I hop in? Oh. Can I hop in, uh, Danny? Go, go ahead, yes, please. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. So um, it's very, very important. Um, I, I, I think that um, we're all aware that sometimes with improvements comes um, Comes always, but lots of times comes gentrification, and um, we are aware of it. And this particular panel didn't focus on our anti gentrification efforts, um, but those go hand in hand in parallel. So EHC, for example, we are um, looking into the possibility of a community land trust. We receive funding to to um, to move that planning forward, and we're looking at additional affordable housing. Um, 
uh, sites within the community. We're highly active in the Barrio Logan Community Plan update and trying to find ways to um, uh, to address gentrification um, and displacement through policy in the community plan and hoping to export that model to other community plans and their updates. So um, we're very engaged in anti-gentrification work. Um, and it is it is very important, right? We want to see these improvements. We want the community to become healthier. Um, but for the people that live there, right? Um, what's what's the point um, of things improving if we all have to leave to some continues to be right? So that's my two cents. Again, this particular panel wasn't focused on our education efforts, but they do go hand in hand. And as we advance um, environmental justice, and as we advance um, infrastructure and and um, and positive uh, urban greening strategies. We're also pursuing anti-gentrification anti and anti-displacement policy. Thanks, Julie. Danny, did you want to? No, you, you did great. Thanks, Julie. Awesome. Thank you, Julie. Um, and you know, you can always feel free if anyone has questions after this panel. Um, you can reach out to us at CPI um, or any of our our partners um, to kind of get involved more. And so now that we have learned about the many important environmental justice priorities that have the potential to really transform our communities, it is time to take the next step. So at the CBA, we aren't just about policy, we are also about action. So now our amazing organizers and we will walk us through how we can all advocate for these priorities in the um, current budget cycle and you know, take action to show our elected officials that you know, we care about environmental justice. Hi everyone, <clears throat> and thank you for joining the um, environmental justice um, panel today. As again, my name is Jean Wee, pronoun he, him, his. I'm the organizer with CBI and the CBA Coalition. So I'm gonna drop the link, the action link inside the chat. I would really appreciate it if you guys can click on that for a second. And I'll walk you guys through some of the action that you can take. So basically the first one is you can send a quick email to the mayor by clicking on the link and it should be super fast and easy. All you have to do is just go there and it will take you to the link and filling out a quick information and then you hit send. Voila, you, everyone can send in really quick email. It takes less than five seconds to do so. And then the next part is the social media storm. You can do either Facebook or Twitter, which simply click on the link and it will take you to our post. And all you have to do is share on your personal Facebook. Yeah. Okay, let me try to share. Okay, because I'm on the CBH, so. Once you click on that, you should be able to share. The same with Twitter as well. You click on it and you should be able to share. Now, if you want to share it on Instagram, then you're going to have to follow the instruction. Basically click on the document, go to download the, the image, grab the message, you have hashtag, and similarly tag all of our elected official. Last, next, next, um, next action is to basically to complete a quick survey so the city of San Diego Planning Department have put out an environmental justice survey for our community input. This is an important part because it will allow us to basically share with the city um, what we think what we think gonna be good for our um, for our environment, for our community. And this survey is conveniently translated to all languages for you. So all you have to do is just click on the one that, that appropriate and filling it out, it's very simple. Um, so I would hope that you also do that as well. Lastly, um, click on this link and join our future event. So we're looking at, as you can tell, the CBA have been having the panelist event um, every single Tuesday to engage with the community. Now, um, after this one, we have three more. Um, which is housing tandem right, people economy, and redefining public safety um, round two. So we hope to see you there. Thank you.